The purpose of this presentation is to build your knowledge about orthographic mapping, what it is, why it's so important for learning to read, and I hope that once you understand why it's so important and important for learning to read and how it develops, you're going to see the role it can play for students who have difficulty reading words, for those having difficulty using their decoding strategies when they read, for those who have fluency that is labored, and those who lack comprehension. So all of these may, in fact, be very much impacted by that inability to orthographically map. Okay, so Linnea Airy is a researcher that originally put forth this theory and research regarding orthographic mapping, and she did so in the 70s and 80s. And as you can see from this blue box on this slide, she has done extensive research on this topic alone. It's not even an exhaustive list that I have here. Others have tested her theory, and as a result, we know that skilled readers possess these necessary things to orthographically map, to map the sounds of words in our head to the letters on the page so that they become permanently stored, instantly recognizable words. So these kids can take full advantage of this process of orthographic mapping. So that's Linnea Airy. And I also recommend this book for more on it. Um, so by the time a student is in high school, they have about 80,000 words in their vocabularies. Doing the math, a skilled reader in 12th grade has learned on average about 15 words a day, about 5,000 words a year, and they can likely read these words. It's absolutely incredible without even going into the ramifications <clears throat> who can manage to accomplish this and versus those who don't. Let's just assume we're all aware of advantages of being able to read well enough that many words can just be learned in terms of success in school, post-secondary ed, life afterwards. To learn this many words, readers have to accumulate really quickly and with very little effort a huge pool of words they can read by sight. And this all comes about because they can orthographically map. So this term, orthographic mapping, I'm going to get sick of saying it by the time we're done here. It sounds mysterious, complicated, weird. Some just call it sight word learning, so that would be enough. But in order to understand that, what is a sight word? I gotta go there first. Okay, as seen in one of these presentations that I have here, a sight word is any word that you can read instantaneously and automatically without effort. So if you need to go back to that presentation, go there. You don't need to decode a sight word. You don't need to sound it out. You don't need to think, gee, what's this one look like? Another word that I know, maybe. You don't need to look at the first letters or a picture to guess it. It's any word in print that when you look at it, you can't not read it. You can't suppress it. It's a word that pops, okay, off the page into your head. Once a word becomes instantaneously recognizable, once it's a sight word, it is yours forever. If 20 years goes by, before you see it again. You won't have to study and refamiliarize yourself with it. It'll just pop to you again. So you can't suppress them, they pop. You just look at them, they enter your mind. You kind of hear them as though your subconscious is reading it to you. <laughs> um, its pronunciation is correct and you'll even have some meaning attached to it too. What the thing is, what it looks like, what its function is. All right, your brain processes sight words in many ways. Their individual phonemes are activated in the phonological processor. The various meanings are activated in the meaning processor. All possible meanings, too. And so, say the word bugs. This meaning processor is going to bring forth insects, spying devices, bugging your little brother, annoying someone. Its relation to the language of the surrounding words of the text is activated by a context processor in our brain. So, Let's narrow down which version of bugs we're needing here, it says. And the way it's represented with letters, it's how its spelling is activated in an orthographic processor. We have many ways of spelling the pronunciation of aisle. An aisle in a store, I'll call you later, or an aisle with a tropical aisle. So it's so amazing to think of all the brain has to do to learn and process words. It seems natural. <laughs> it absolutely is not. Our teaching can go a long way towards making it easier for our kids, though, more efficient and more effective if we use evidence-based practices um, based on the research. 
So the strip test here, fun way to demonstrate the power of sight words to demonstrate how you can't suppress them. You can hit pause here and try to ignore the words. Just go through them saying out loud the color that the letters are printed in. Don't read the words. Okay, so hit pause and do this for a few seconds and then come back. All right, if you were able to do this accurately, I imagine you had to go really, not really slowly, but slowly and get a little tripped up and nervous. It's hard to suppress these words because they're sight words for you. You can't not read them. All right, here's another way to demonstrate it, to demonstrate your sight word vocabulary, as some will call it. And this is an experiment done by Linnea Airy and her, her um, I don't know, Wills. Okay, I couldn't read that. Um, and just ignore the word on top of the item and name the item and hit pause and do that. Okay, just name the item, don't read the words. All right, so how did you do here? I bet you had to put a lot of effort into not reading those words. This demonstrates sight vocabulary clearly. You had to suppress saying those printed words very hard. Precognitive, this means it's already there and already available before you even have a chance to consciously think about it. All right, what we don't mean by, what we don't mean by sight words, words that are analyzed in any way, decoded, chunked, thought about. Um, I'm not talking about words that are memorized because they're regularly spelled or words that are frequently in text. We don't mean word wall words when we say sight words. Many in education refer to these type of words as sight words, thinking because they just have to be memorized by sight, which isn't true. Um, see the presentation on irregular words. All right, so the reason for promoting sight words, for the development of sight words, for the development of a sight word vocabulary, as some people say, is because once you have a pool of these words, tons of them, you're going to read fluently. It's effortless. They pop off the page, whoop, and you are find reading enjoyable. You don't have to think about them. And sight words are what allow your brains to then go, ah, now I can think about the meaning, and I can do a lot of learning here. That's the beauty of it. Okay, one more bit about fluency, even though this is about sight words. <laughs> um, because truly the point of sight words is to make reading easier, which is what makes us read fluently. Some kids, as they learn to read, they quickly gain the ability to read words in a unitized way. They see the letters C, A, T together on a page and they say cat. They say C, C, A, S, T and they say cast. Kids who can't unitize spellings into sight words have these behaviors that we see over and over again. They come to a word, they sound it out one letter at a time, one sound at a time. They blend it together. Turn the page, see it again, same word, do the same thing again and again and again. It takes them a while to memorize that word to get it in the long-term memory. <clears throat> this is painstaking and laborious. Their peers, in the meanwhile, are able to read a word just one or two times and then those words become, those letters in that word become unitized and even sometimes never seen before words are read automatically and accurately for those kids. And they can even do it with nonsense words. We can show them M-I-P and they'll say MIP without thinking about it. So why is it that those kids can do that? What have they gained to be able to orthographically map? How come their brains have learned to process and interact with letters and connect them to sounds? How, can, how do they do what they do? Well, the word orthographic mapping, they map the phonemes and words that they already have in their phonological memories to the sequences of the letters on the page that represent those phonemes in their mind. So we're going to see what is required for this to happen. And <clears throat> I need you to remember that a phoneme is an individual speech sound. It is a piece, a tiniest piece of our spoken words. It never refers to what's printed into letters. It's, it's nothing that we see. It's all sound-based phonemes. Aries articles on sight words show an experiment she did in 1983 with Wills again where they compared readers in second and fourth grade, um, skilled readers, to unskilled readers in second and fourth grade. They had kids read words, um, CVC nonsense words, and even name some digits. Even as early as second grade, kids who are learning to read easily can read words as quickly and effortlessly as they can name a single digit, about eight tenths of a second. You can show them <clears throat> the, number, uh, the digit four 
and a word from one of their books, and they'll say them both at the, with the same speed and effortlessness. The less skilled readers in second grade weren't able to do that until fourth grade. Okay. Interesting. So unskilled, slower to learn readers are not efficient. They haven't built, they don't have what they need to orthographically map, so they stay hesitant and choppy and disfluent and letter by letter. So orthographic, what's it mean? Ortho means straight, think of an orthodontist teeth, and graph means writing, so correct writing. For example, in English, one of our conventions at the end of a word is to use CK. We never use CK at the beginning of a word. And we have a convention of using a, a silent E at the end of a word to make a vowel say its long sound and so on. So these are our orthographic spelling conventions, how words are spelled to represent our sounds. Correct writing. Okay, time to get to how it all works. Remember, you might struggle to understand this, so I'm going to try to break it down. Um, first, a couple of definitions and stuff. Okay, there they are. And now here's a simplistic definition or representation of what happens. We form connections between our pronounced phonemes that are in our heads and the order of the printed letters for that word. We connect and map those phonemes that we know to the particular sequences in print. So then that becomes the, the brain goes, okay, that chunk, that spelling, that order of letters is this word. So over on the left, there's a speech bubble, and it demonstrates that this reader knows the word father, and they have phoneme awareness. This reader can, her brain can say um, automatically that the sounds in father are f, ah, v, er, okay? So she's not thinking about this consciously, but her brain can do it. And next, the post-it note on the right has a bunch of, um, words that very much look visually like the word father, and father is in there. Very similar spellings, visually similar. But this new reader looks at the note, comes to the word father, maybe it's her first time, and her brain, as she starts sounding it out, is has the word father already in there, and then she maps those sounds, f, a, v, er, and goes, oh, ah, and this word is spelled with an A, not ah as in top. Er is spelled with a ER, not with the OR, like in doctor or worm. So the brain says, okay, for the word father that I know, it's spelled with these letters in this order, and now I have a picture for father, I have it, I'm going to chunk it together. Key, key, key here is that the orthographic mapping requires speech, the sounds, to go to print. Um, our brains are going to the writing on the page. It's different than decoding where um, the printed word is on the page and then we turn it into sound and this matters in a little bit. Okay. Um, Alright, so I'm not a fan of reading off of slides, but forgive me for a little bit here for a couple, it's important. Um, so we all have what's known as a phonological lexicon, fancy speak. For a phonological lexicon is our memory for the sounds of words. And we have a semantic lexicon which holds words for which we have knowledge of their meaning. So if a particular word is in our semantic lexicon, say hose, we know its meaning, and then it's automatically in our phonological lexicon because we remember familiar sounding words. So if I learn the meaning for hose, I've also got the sound of it. Okay, so a reader knows the word at. It's part of her phonological lexicon, it's in her head. She knows she's familiar with its sounds. She's aware that this spoken word has two sounds, a, t. She has phoneme awareness. So she's got three things going for her. A word that's in her phonological memory, she's familiar with it, it sounds. She's got letter sounds, and she's got phoneme awareness, yay. So she comes to at the very first few times, she's very little. And she accurately sounds it out, a, t, at. Her brain has a little aha moment behind the scenes, and it mapped the a to the a and the t to the t. A correspondence between the sounds of the word and the letters on the page representing those sounds was attended to. It wasn't even conscious for her. This particular spelling, the order of those letters, A and T, mapped and bonded um, to the sounds in her head of that, for that word. So the letters A and T became a unit. It's now unitized in her memory, and the next time it's seen, this process won't, isn't even necessary. The brain will just give it to her. Going forward, it'll see at in words, It'll be unitized as making the at sound, like in spat, pattern, etc. 
Okay. So now the reader also knows the word hate. It's part of her phonological lexicon. She's heard it many times and she knows the sounds of this word. It's part of a word she's familiar with. And she has her phoneme awareness in the words, a phoneme's eight. She's aware of these two parts, these two sounds in the word. And when she's encountering this word in print for the very first time, she may not accurately sound it out, but when she learns that the E at the end of this word makes the vowels say a different sound, it makes it say its name, her brain will go, okay. And she'll attend to this, you know, subconsciously or whatever. She'll look at this particular spelling. She'll map A t to an A and a T and an E. Not E-A-T, nope, that's not eight, that's eat. Not T-E-A, that's T. And not E-T-A, that's Ada. So now A-T-E, eight, is a unit for that reader. It's bonded in memory as a whole unitized chunk. Going forward, her brain sees eight in words. And now it'll make the eight sound in words for her. You can see how orthographic mapping helps readers instantaneously read never seen before words. So that's how that happens. All right, last little example here. All right, so sequences are unitized even when they're not really real words. So we did at and eight, but a reader may unitize L and A is laugh for the first time because using letter sound knowledge and phoneme awareness help them read words like lad or lap. For this reader, L, A, la, is instantaneously familiar, and because this reader's eyes perceive that sequence, by the way, we can see it, our brains take up 14 letters to the right, it's activated as a unit. So la is brought forth without having to go l, a anymore. So this process of unitizing, um, gluing together sequences grows and grows, and eventually the reader's brain recognizes lay, makes the sound lay as in later and label, and then it makes the sound la as, as in gala or granola. Okay, so it, it learns and accepts these things. On this slide, the larger bolded words on the top rows represent those printed on paper. The letters beneath this, them with the slash marks represent the phonemes we attach to those printed sequences of letters. So if a student sees a word and pays attention to how the phonemes of that word map to those spellings of the word, those letters in that word are going to be a sight word much more efficiently than seeing it dozens and dozens of times and having to memorize it. So readers that are efficient at this orthographic mapping because their brains have become accustomed to using their letter sounds that they're automatic with and their phoneme awareness that they have, they've been able to attend to the order of letters and words. They're never going to look at the word phonograph and say photograph. They won't make that mistake. That mistake, phonograph for photograph, teachers and school psych people see this all the time. They can give lists of words to read, and the weaker readers, I hate that word, but they'll confuse one word for another because they've grown as readers by de depending on memory, visual memory, and by uh, on the, the crutch of context. Skilled readers will never mix phonograph and photograph. Their brains see each letter in a word, and those letters in an order to res result in one response forever. Okay. So unitization is like the rocket fuel that propels sight word development. Don't forget the brain still notices each and every letter in a word forever, as we discussed in the presentation in this series on um, how brains read. But at the same time, it notices unitized sequences. It does both. It notices and rejects unfamiliar or atypical sequences. That This was in the presentation on syllable types. And this is how skilled readers can chunk automatically syllables. We can't just tell our students when they come to a long word, chunk it. No, no, no. Because if their brains haven't captured and stored these units as acceptable sequences, they won't see the chunks. Sight word development, though, is really rocketed forward as, as kids accumulate those familiar sequences and words, pay attention to them, and say, aha, I got it. So unitization makes it as though we, it's, it makes it seem like we've read words as whole units. Unskilled readers, are usually missing key elements, so they can't do this. Their letter sound knowledge is probably weak or was weak. Yes, even older students and adults don't know a lot of vowel teams. Missing words or word parts in their phonological lexicon, or they lack phoneme awareness um, very often. So, why do some students miss out on churning 
dozens and hundreds and thousands of words into sight words easily and automatically because they're missing one of these three things necessary. Okay, so the top in the um, top blue box, letter sounds. Okay, that knowledge, automatic letter sound knowledge, including which phoneme letters are usually symbolized in words. For example, P makes P, H makes P, but when they're together, it makes F. The letter sounds are used by readers to form connections between the letters on the paper and those phonemes that we speak. So phoneme awareness then, the specifics about phoneme awareness are described in the next few slides. Um, pause on that. Pronunciations of words that we have in phonological memory, a student can then break those down using their phonological awareness. They can segment and manipulate them proficiently, subconsciously, automatically, with no cognitive effort. Um, they then map those sounds to the letters we see on the page. Of course, they got to learn those letter sounds. So to just decode a word, we need to look at the letters, translate them into sounds, and use the phoneme awareness skill of blending, put them together. But to turn it into a sight word, a unitized, instantly recognizable sight word, we have to also be able to consciously notice, <laughs> map, and even subconsciously that later, the particular sequence of letters in that word. I know we've all worked with students where we've given them systematic explicit phonics. They can decode words accurately. They can blend like crazy. They can apply the rules we've taught them, but they still lack that automaticity and fluency. So let's go on to see how blending sounds from print isn't enough. There's that uh, other piece of phonological awareness that we really got to pay attention to. And for more on this, this is the book I'll leave it here for you to look at. <laughs> it's clearer. All right, so decoding is converting print to sound. It's important. It's crucially important. It's valuable. We see this so often. Students decode a word and they even miss a phoneme or two, and yet the thing they come up with and say is close enough to what it must be that they know that you know, that they can get it right, especially if they've been reading in context, that helps. So that's why kids with uh, better vocabularies tend to compensate or hide <laughs> any inaccuracies or weaknesses in their decoding. Here's an example. Most children um, know what a museum is. They, they've heard of it. It's part of their phonological lexicon, the word museum. Um, they're familiar. Um, but when they go to blend the sounds of the word together, they might pronounce it as um, museum or museum. The pronunciation is close enough, and maybe the context was about a museum, so they're going to get it. Okay, so, oh, museum, they'll say. Great, this is really great. But we don't want them to decode museum, museum, 10, 20 times, letter by letter, and have the slowness happen over and over. One, two, three times, and they should be able to read it accurately. It should be unitized, M-U-S-E-U-M. They see it. The brain goes 14 letters, sees them all at once, and gives it to you. Museum, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. All right, but wait. Research shows us that this orthographic mapping, for it to happen, students need more levels of phone, sophisticated levels of phoneme awareness. Um, so for blending and segmenting to occur in KN1, that's great, that's appropriate. But after that, more sophisticated stuff needs to happen. It's not enough to just segment and blend. This research shows us that even up until fourth and fifth grade, students are still learning to manipulate phonemes, to delete sounds, to substitute sounds. It's still a challenge for them. Uh, tons of research literature shows that those who can do that phoneme manipulation at a proficient level are the better word readers and word learners. Readers have to manipulate phonemes in order to do this mapping and turn new words into sight words. Read this for more. So the act of decoding is kind of a gimme. Um, the letters are already laying there on the paper. The sounds of the word are already laying there, segmented so to speak. All we have to do is translate those squiggles into sounds and push them together into a word that we know, but it's not enough to really make it so that words are, uh, sight words in, that you can't suppress. 
the level where students that struggle max out in terms of PA abilities is segmenting. <clears throat> they can do that. They can blend. We can give them like a Dibbles or Ainsweb or Star or something similar in which we give them a small little word and say, can you tell me the sounds in Bob? And they can, they can, and then we're satisfied it seems. And all right, this student has phonemic awareness and we think we're all done. So the most cognitive muscle struggling readers ever build, it seems, is that ability to just segment and blend. And this can only get them so far. The proficiency with more advanced levels is needed. So by, prof by proficiency, we mean automaticity, being fast and easy with it. Advanced levels, what we mean by that is doing something more sophisticated than just segmenting or blending. So being proficient means the brain can boom, boom, automatically, subconsciously get those phonemes um, from their phonological memory. And this is all happening, by the way, um, all this that we've been talking about is unconscious, subconscious. Please don't think like so many do that we're sitting there consciously and deliberately saying, hmm, okay, this sound in my head mm, maps to that letter there. No, this could never happen with the tens of thousands of words that we've learned. It happens really amazingly, like a miracle behind the scenes. Our brains have the raw materials to make it happen if we've been taught. And then it runs. I mean, it just goes. It's like a computer. Once it has the letter sounds, boop, boop, the phonemes at that advanced proficient levels, it's going to take orthographic mapping and do it without us ever thinking of beep, 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 bit, bit by bit. Okay, time to get real. If I've heard this once, I've heard it a million times. She does great when we're working on words, but then we go to read those same words in the text, and it's like she's never seen them before. I hear this all the time. Well, think about what has to happen when we read connected text. A student now has to bring forth the abilities with the letter sounds of blending, trying to comprehend the text, paying attention to the vocabulary, looking at the punctuation. It is a hugely complex feat. And so David Kilpatrick, this author here, he uses um, the analogy of playing basketball. He says when he's alone in his driveway, I love this story, he does pretty well standing there getting the, bas the ball in the basket, these free throws. But if he goes to play a real game on the court with his friends and he has to concentrate on the defenseman and the rules of the game and the clock time ticking down and the ball handling and the running, his percentage of successful baskets falls really dramatically. So we can use this as an analogy for decoding words on cards, uh, you know, on index cards or in isolation, that's simpler than reading those in text. So here's why a more sophisticated and more proficient level of phoneme awareness is mandatory. Once we're in the middle of a more complex task, reading in a book, we have to make sure that the little sub-skills for the task are automatic. More complex phoneme awareness higher automaticity, instant responses. That's the stuff that lets the brain do what it's got to do um, to connect the phonemes and bring forth the words on the page so that we can then um, uh, do all of this stuff with ease and this proficiency. So then we can, um, our brain is kind of relieved uh, of some of the workload um, to get orthographic mapping, um, I guess, accomplished. So access to phonemes, quick. Automatic, instantaneous, that's our goal. Okay. <clears throat> so manipulation tasks all require the simpler, like I said, tasks of segmenting and blending. To say sto without the t, -t one has to segment it in their head. St -o -o. Remove that T and then put it back together again. To change sto to slow, one has to segment it identify the one to remove, put in the new one, and then blend it back all together again. So manipulation requires four things to happen, right? Four tasks. And if you don't have those four tasks sufficient yet, how can you do all four at once? Um, so that's the level of proficiency. If you can change stow to slow instantaneously, um, your a brain is not a machine that gets stuck. <laughs> it doesn't have to put any effort into manipulating sounds and words. It's so it's a computer that can just 
crank out the answer instantaneously. This is what we want. Okay, so you might want to pause at this slide here, but it's adapted from this text again. This, I mean, he really makes it so clear. And it illustrates how students advance in their phonological awareness development, and as that happens, their ability to read words advances as well. So definitely, in a minute, pause this and look it over carefully. There's arrows indicating recipro reciprocal relationship. There's um, phoneme awareness can help word reading and vice versa. And then you can see the big blue arrows showing how letter sounds are critical for later levels of development and such. Um, so we can see that basic phoneme awareness skills, segmenting and blending, what we typically have always worked for in schools, and then that's enough, we always stop there. That is only enough to get us to the decoding level. Over and over, there's those kids that struggle learning to read. They have a problem with phonological processing, and our systematic explicit phonics helps them to decode accurately, yet there's that wall, that stubborn wall that's hard to get them over, that's, that halting word-by-word -word decoding. Um, disfluent reading is still there. So we have to assess phoneme awareness at the more advanced levels, stow to slow, for, and so on, and determine you know, their proficiency, how automatically they can do it, and then just train and instruct them manipulating phonemes at these levels. And this will allow, you know, help their brains. Um, it puts the input into the computer. Um, the same should be said for letter sounds too because they should be automatic too. You shouldn't hesitate at what the vowel teams and such are saying. All right, I wanna give one more shout out from this book. It's a phrase on page 83, Kilpatrick, says it beautifully, he says, quote, individuals with reading problems commonly display difficulties in both phonic decoding and instant word de retrieval. Phonic decoding and orthographic mapping are so central to the development of proficient reading that research on both of these word level reading processes should drive our assessments, instructional practices, and intervention efforts. So now that you have an inkling, a beginning understanding about orthographic mapping, I mean, you it would be great to have a deeper understanding and that'll come as you read more about it. For now you get the sense that sight words are really important, what they are, and that to build a set of them, a bank of them, a pool of them, you need orthographic mapping and then in order to do that you need proficiency with letter sounds and more advanced phonemic awareness. Have I said it enough? <laughs> You're able to um, look and at your reading programs and your assessments to make sure you include those pieces how your instruction and intervention should, in, it could, should include those pieces too. You should understand now too. All right, crucial pieces. Um, for a really great resource to learn more about this as well, I don't have one with me, but there's a picture here. This, this text contains a few nice chapters and easy reading on this topic, and then some quick one minute activities that you can do two or three times a day with your students. They actually take like 30 minutes, seconds, 40 seconds and it builds that proficiency in phoneme awareness. This is a manual by David Kilpatrick too. He wrote it for this express purpose and it's available at www.equipforreadingsuccess.com. All right, we're done here. Thank you so much for participating in this knowledge series. I know it's quick, but it's an introduction to some knowledge that you need and I hope you'll watch others in this series as well. Thank you.